Hi, I'm Chris Kevorkian, MPA. I'd like you to join me in welcoming our What's New at the Digital Newsstand panelists, Keith Barraclaw, Chief Technology Officer, Executive Vice President, Products, Next Issue Media, otherwise known as NIM. Uh, Ryan Marquis, Founder and Chief Operating Officer, Pixel Mags. And Jeannie Mullen, Global Executive Vice President, Chief Marketing Officer, Zinio. So it was just shy of a year ago that this wonderfully beautiful, delightfully disruptive you know, product arrived on the scene. Uh, and the tablet, some said, was you know, here to save magazines. And while you know, the magazine model is certainly maybe challenged, uh, when 95% of adults are engaged in one or more magazine media brand, clearly magazines matter and don't so much need to be saved. What is in order is not saving but evolving, creating, and accessing. And not surprisingly, magazine publishers have embraced the new opportunities to storytell, create and curate digital content, and surprise and delight new and existing readers with an elegant new iterative and interactive device. Anyone reading about CES 2011 in Las Vegas heard that there were going to be 80 new tablets this year. Um, I think there are 80 manufacturers who'd be willing to bring one to market. Right now, we've got the iPad and the iPad 2. Uh, there's a Galaxy out there. There's a Zoom. There are some who, I think, wish that somebody would waited a little longer and improved the product. It's not that competitive a landscape just yet. And at least uh, you know, one of these two will, will be a player against Apple. Uh, we're also waiting to see what happens with uh, Research in Motion. Will, will their playbook ever make a play? We will see. There are also e-readers to consider, both the, uh, in the newsstand and digital arena, both black and white and color, as we've just heard. Uh, by holiday season, it'll be interesting to see how many are in play. Last week, Bloomberg interviewed David Carey, president of Hearst Magazines. And when asked in conversation about NIMS Digital Storefront Initiative and the State of the Union, uh, David Carey said, you know, it really is early days. You probably have things in your refrigerator that are older than this business. So, of course, I had to go home <laughs> and look in the refrigerator. I opened it up, and sure enough, these cocktail olives stuffed with <laughs> pimentos are, are two years old, certainly older than this business. Um, so, Clearly, I should be drinking more and consuming more cocktail, cocktail olives. Um, but there's a bit of a theme here. There's much to celebrate in magazine media. And while it is still early days, we have to get our, dish, our digital issues out there and into our readers' hands in new and better ways uh, more quickly. So what's new at the digital newsstand? Uh, you know, we know that Google and Apple have recently made some changes and plays in that arena. And Yahoo is getting into the game with their live stand as well. So the question is, what can we expect from these companies and what can they share with us about perhaps others in terms of bringing magazine media to our consumers, consumers who are enthralled with this new product platform. They want their magazines and they want them now. So Jeannie, we'll start with you. Uh, what does the new stand of the future look like? Uh, will there be one new stand, in your opinion, with the eye to with the eye store, you know, dictating the form and function? Is there one print newsstand? No, I, I think there's going to be multiple choices for consumers, and where we really see the future going is moving on to the next phase of digital consumption for magazines. You've all seen tremendous examples of design. You've seen phenomenal examples of adoption. Really what we're seeing now is customer lifestyle integration. And where we see the newsstand of the future going is away from placing covers 
and asking people out there in the street who may never have engaged with your brand in the past because they haven't had access to it, they hadn't been familiar with it, to look at a cover and really understand if this is a brand that meets their needs and resonates with them, and really opening up the content to exploration and personal preferences. You may not realize that Dwell actually does a phenomenal study on, and in-depth interview on people that own restaurants inside the San Francisco area to be compelled to go there. If you're a foodie, Dwell Magazine may be exactly what you need at certain times during the year. So where we see the newsstand of the future going is in a completely different direction than looking at recreating print and moving it online and looking at our consumers to realize their passions, their interests, and their indicators for purchase intent and really opening up the content in those ways. That requires all of us in this room and all of us here on this panel to innovate, to produce, to test, and really capitalize on this new opportunity that we have. Thanks. Yeah. Ryan, you're up next. All right. Uh, with with the, the prognosticators and the forecasters saying it's largely going to be an Apple iPad dominated world for some say as long as the next three years. What are your thoughts on you know the issues that developers and publishers are facing uh, with regard to the Apple payment uh, uh, APIs? Well, as we all know in this uh, room here, uh, all too much, Apple has recently um, made an announcement that publishers have to adhere to their in-app purchase technology and and which, of course, comes with Apple's uh, fees of 30%. Um, our company, Pixel Mags, we actually, we've been very public about this. We're very open to that, and we've worked with Apple uh, for a few years now, and we love the in-app purchase technology. We've been using their subscription SKUs from day one. Um, their new offerings that they're putting on the table now, we feel, is a huge benefit not only to consumers, but also to publishers at large. Uh, the fact that when someone buys a say a 12-month subscription now, and it's automatically renewed unless that consumer goes in and cancels, I think is a great benefit to the publishers. They don't have to go after their traditional ways of mailings, emails, uh, doing uh, different offers to capture that consumer again as far as a renewal. And, and we think that's a great benefit to have that automatic renew technology built into the subscription feature. Certainly, that's what co consumers are looking for. Have you done research uh, against that to inform how you've built out the product and how it's worked? Well, we, as far as research goes, I mean, we have over 250 applications live in the App Store, and we've sold you know, a few million issues so far. Um, so we know that consumers are adopting this technology, and we know that consumers are buying uh, thousands of subscriptions, not only on our platform, but on Zinio's platform and other platforms that are out there. So. Um, our numbers are only going up, and uh, so I would say that consumers are absolutely adopting that and, and taking this new form of subscription to, you know, and running with it. Great. So Keith, uh, what makes the wave of new interactive magazines, from your perspective, so compelling that you're building out, you know, a, a new digital newsstand? And, and as a follow-up to that, you know, how will what you're building be different from what we've seen so far? And I think everyone in this room would like to know, when are we going to see it? <laughs> All of that in one. Um, I can repeat the question. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> the multi-part question. Yes. So um, I, I think the, the first thing is that, obviously, what we're very excited about is, um, is the wave of interactivity that's come, right? So what you're seeing now is an ability for editors and, and the, the creative staff to really express a new way of delivering the brand, um, of delivering their, their magazine experience, and we're very focused on making that the forefront of what NIM de um, delivers. So really focused on the wave of interactivity that we're seeing now and going forward. Um, I think that, that what becomes interesting after that is how you take that interactivity, layer it onto different canvases, whether that's mobile devices, whether that's the desktop, um, and how you can start to offer some, some level of social functionality that will tie all of these brand experiences together and really deliver them for the publishers. So I think that's sort of our, our first thing, is really sort of going this, this new wave of interactivity is, is something special and, and something that we've, we've really focused on. Um, your, your question then about the when, we've... Uh, I've got a calendar right here. You got it? Yeah, okay. Um, 
so, so we basically have said this spring um, that, that we will uh, that we will be launching, and I'm wearing purple. Okay, and and, and spring in California, <laughs> pretty much here. Spring yeah. in New York, maybe not quite here yet. Um, to to sort of to look to sort of put a uh, a framework on that. We have um, some partners that we're working with in delivering NIM. Um, very excited about how that rolls out. Um, we're working with them, aligning with their products and services, so that when we launch, we we have a vehicle to bring this out in a way that. Um, we think is important for building the relationship with the consumer and enabling the publishers to actually be able to start to, to generate that direct relationship with the consumer, which is after all what NIM is about. It's for the publishers to actually have that direct relationship with the consumer and continue to build that relationship with the consumer. So is what you were describing early on in your comment, something like a Netflix opportunity where people cross platform will be able to engage in their branded experience? So there's, you know, I think that y you could roll out a lot of um, interesting purchasing and subscription models. We've definitely built NIM so that it can support a number of models. What you'll see is we will roll out various ways that consumers can purchase um, and engage um, in the brand over time, but certainly there's going to be a, a varied way that you can sign up and get your digital edition, if you like, alongside you know, your print and, and other um, subscriptions that you may be making with the publisher and with the brand. So over time, taking that, making that uh, a cross-brand experience is absolutely what having sort of these, these high-value brands and titles all in uh, a very consumable marketplace. That's, that's what it's all about. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. And when will there be engagement from non-NIM brands in that opportunity? We're, we're actively talking with other publishers outside of the, the NIM consortium um, as we speak. Great. Jeannie, back to you. Uh, research from a variety of publishers point toward tablet users liking interactivity. Uh, especially true for brands, some of which we've seen showcased earlier this morning, um, that have highly involved readers. Uh, what, in your view, is the role of interactivity as it pertains to app trial and, importantly, renewal? So, um, it becomes very tricky when you start getting into tablets and devices because a lot of the consumer decisions are being led by the device itself. Um, so the first layer is to really understand the devices that you're working with. And I mean, I have four devices with me. This is what I standard carry around everywhere, but I usually have a computer too. Each of these devices have an absolutely different price point. Each of them have gotten significantly and varied reviews in the marketplace from the tech. And thus, each one of them has a very different adoption rate and usage rate for Zinio so far. We see different patterns based on three different levels. Where you live in the world, uh, geography dictates what you're buying. People outside of the US traditionally buy single issues over subs. So that has a significant impact over renewals, um, especially if you're a US magazine looking to expand internationally and have a relationship with your licensees in parallel. The second thing that we see is that people look at the devices. Um, you know, and I thought Jonathan talking about the Nook was phenomenal. It's a $200 device. You're going to get different adoption rates of people who are spending $600 or $800 for a Zoom right now. Those people tend to buy much more content. They're not price sensitive at all. They're very focused on using it as an active part of their lifestyle. They have significantly higher renewal rates because they've bought into the device and they're going to get as much value as they can out of it. And then you've got people who are you know, new to the whole space. And there's this great stat that I heard that 65% of people in their 60s that get an iPad, the first thing they do to look for apps is go to a Google toolbar in Safari because they've never heard of the App Store. So they're getting, app, they're getting iPads for presents to look at photos and for dexterity reasons, and they don't know anything about Apple's world. So the engagement rate, um, once you get into a magazine, interactivity, huge to keep people engaged, to keep them coming back to it. Um, to renew subscriptions, though, is based on a whole totally different set of tier of, of circumstances. So interactive, interactivity helps, interactivity. particularly on the, on, the, on the iPad, on the tablet platform. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. So Ryan, you were recently quoted in Forbes in association with your ownership, love to find out how you did that, of the term I newsstand, and that in March or April, 
I'll point out it's March, we're well into March, you would introduce a new patent pending technology that will be a massive game changer, uh, promising to revolutionize the way consumers read, buy, and digest media. So? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> Big question. Well, you put it out there, it was in Forbes and a lot of other places, so it wasn't hard to find. So iNewsstand, yes, uh, our company, PixelMag, we do own the, um, I guess you can say, the app name in the uh, iTunes world. Um, we, it is in our uh, account, and we are actively developing out a newsstand application. Uh, it is going to be cross-platform. It is going to be launched uh, Q2, Q3, probably a little behind schedule as far as that quote was uh, March, April. It's going to be a little pushed back from there. But it's going to roll out on the iPad. It's going to roll out on Android 3.0 tablets. And uh, we're also actively developing on the BlackBerry Playbook platform. And um, as far as content go, our goal for iNewsstand is to accept uh, multiple forms of input, meaning uh, PDF, we have a set of tool sets now called PixelMag 2.0, which allows publishers to upload their PDFs and fully make those interactive with some easy drag and drop tools. They can embed videos and slideshows and URLs, and we actually have an HTML5 insertion tool that they can bring these magazines to life in a very easy format. And then, of course, there's a lot of different other tablet formats in the space right now that we're, we are actively looking at to adopt those and uh, create readers to have those also uh, for sale inside of iNewsstand. So it's a pretty big project. There are some things that we're not openly discussing yet. Um, I picked up on that. So, but, uh, uh, so, so snapshot, I'm a consumer who loves magazines, loves consuming them across a variety of digital platforms. This is gonna matter to me, why? Well, number one, it's gonna give you a way to read uh, many different magazines in many different formats in one location. It's gonna be a global newsstand, so we are partnering with publishers from around the globe, not only in the US, but in Greece and Brazil and England, and it's gonna be a global newsstand, and it's gonna automatically change based on your location, and consumers can change different things. So there's a lot of exciting features inside of our newsstand that's gonna uh, revolutionize the space. And will be transactionally easy, that's what I'm looking for. Absolutely. Okay. And our goal at the, is to always make it as easy as possible for the consumer to buy this content, and we will integrate with his whatever uh, device we're on, depending on what that device is, uh, the easiest way for that consumer to purchase that content. Uh, our goal is to uh, have it one or two clicks to purchase a subscription, no matter where you're at. Okay, great. Keith, back to you, that NIM launch date is? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Soon. As I said. Working. I'm trying, guys. I'm right. trying. <laughs> um, there have been issues with uh, app purchase bulk rates and a lot of confusion over the issue of free and then you actually download this and then it costs to have the app or freemium. Um, uh, some confusion and dissatisfaction among customers with regard to that. Um, what does NIM believe consumers want? How are you going to uh, address that issue? So I... I that's a great question. Um, I, I think the things that we've looked at with, with um, certainly the publishers within the consortium is, is exactly that, which is there have been all sorts of interesting ways to, to purchase the content, the magazine, and it has led to you know, certain take rates that just have not been what people expected at all. Interesting meaning confusing. Yes, very um, interesting. Um, so, so what we've done is we're, we're very much looking to simplify the purchasing, Ryan's point, very good one, simplify the purchase experience, simplify the way that the consumer can buy the brand, understand very much what they're getting when they subscribe either to the, the digital or they subscribe to the print, how those things relate to each other and how they can, you know, obviously easily renew any of their subscriptions. And doing that across some, you know, obviously, um, high value brands that are very simply displayed to them. So, you know, we're, we're very much going for the simplistic approach on the purchase because I think it's very easy for us to get ahead of ourselves and try and offer all these new and interesting, weird and wacky ways for consumers to get content. But right now, what they want to understand is, here's the brand I'm looking for. 
I want to be able to get that. I want to be able either to buy a single issue, subscribe to it, or I want to be able to get some way to get my print and my digital together. And that, that's you know, a very simple understand, understandable set of features and functions that we put in the newsstand. So, it, so in, in the world you're building for the consumer, it will be pretty crisp and pretty clear of, yes. of, of exactly what they're getting. Yeah, bring, you know, it, bring it into free, a Free would be absolutely free, and you know, paid is absolutely paid. Yes, and, and bringing them to a place where they're very comfortable about getting to what they want and understanding how they buy it. I mean, I think that that's you know, one of the things that's been emphasized um, through the partners to date is making it absolutely clear what the consumer is paying for and how they get to what they want and, ma and make that whole discoverability thing a very simple approach, right? Mm -hmm. Just because I think that we, we have um, an opportunity to over-apply uh, over technology to, uh, to some of these things versus looking at what people want, which is getting access to that, that premium, exciting new interactive content and not um, over-developing the newsstand to start with as people start to understand what this, this new digital experience can be. Right, and I think that plays to Jeannie's point of the, the consumer is certainly buying a tablet or an iPad is you know, pretty much affluent, educated, you know, really good looking, uh, but they have like, like some, you. like myself, um, they, have, you know, they, they have a couple of frustration points with something that they've invested in and they want to engage in magazine media because they love their brands and they want to discover new brands. But when they go to the App Store, you know, Apple doesn't have a category called magazines. That would be hard. Um, and you know, then when they get there, there's their confusion over how to actually buy it and what that experience is, much less what we've you know, heard a little bit about, about earlier this morning is the navigation norms. And so I, I think to the extent that we can make it simple just to get it, buy what you want when you want it, yep. that would be grand. Um, Jeannie, Zinio has been you know, early in the game at the forefront of digital magazine media. Uh, Having worked with so many publishers, big and small, what do you think publishers want on the digital newsstand front? What's their perspective in terms of you know, their investment? That's, that's a great question. Um, so Zinio will be celebrating 10 years in business um, in April, which is, is great. And it, we've seen a significant change as of April 3rd of last year with the interest from publishers large and small. But, you know, we really haven't seen any consistency across the board. I, I can't tell you definitively, if you're a large publisher, you're going to look to do A, B, and C, and if you're a small publisher, you're gonna look to do D, E, and F. It really is coming down to the individual editors and the publishers who are able to take the digital opportunity, integrate it into their overarching business model, and define how to move forward from there. And one of the things we saw recently with our Harrison Group research study is that 68% of publishers still believe that a huge majority of their funds and investment are going to go towards the web, which absolutely makes sense because that's where a lot of interactive dollars and advertising money is still coming to. This is a very new space and 18 million iPads out there plus the 500,000 they sold this weekend is still a lot less unique than somebody like Hearst gets to all of their properties in, in one month. So there's a reality out there that the investment is based on how you can um, put your arms around the digital opportunity and integrate it into your business model. That said, we've seen some smaller publishers do some phenomenal steps moving forward. Um, Fader, the Fader magazine is, is one of them. Right now it's South by Southwest. Um, they've got the Fader Fort by Fiat and they've cornered off an entire section for e-reading and it's the first time they're gonna get their 60,000 people that come to the Fader Fort to enjoy music to understand how to capitalize on that in a digital fashion differently than what they've been used to before. And that's phenomenal and amazing and significant and they should be commended for that. It took a lot of planning for them to do that. Then on the other side of the world, you know, you have Hearst who is always an innovator and doing some tremendously amazing social community sharing initiatives. Um, in 17, they had, in the 17 issue, they had a deal of a day. Every time you opened up the iPad issue of 17, there was you know, a different deal that updated every day. So that increases engagement. It's, it's not interactive in the way that you've seen in the great Andrew McCarthy videos, but it is interactive as far as getting people to come together and, and come back to a piece of media time and time again. And I think you know, when a business decides what their strategy is, the investment becomes much more definitive. Great, thank you. And with that, I'd like to thank Keith, 
Ryan and Jeannie uh, for a great panel. Hope that helped give you some answers. We don't know when the, you know, the earth shaking thing is going to happen. <laughs> we don't know when NIM's going to do their thing, but you know, stay on the edge of your seat because <laughs> there's great things happening at the digital newsstand. Thank you.